And if you're new, if you're here for the first time, I'm Ron. I'd love to meet you on the porch after the service. Um, I hate to start off by talking about the pandemic, but I'm going to anyway. How many of you actually got COVID during the pandemic? Okay. Okay. Yeah, good, good group. Okay. How about uh, you got it twice? You're in that special club like me. Okay. Okay. Anybody get it three times? Three times. Okay. Extra chocolate Easter bunnies for you today. Okay, okay. So here's how I got it. Uh, we used to have a building over on Marion. Actually, we still own it, and there's a church that's doing really well, thriving in there. And uh, after we shut down our services and we went all digital, we decided to have a, a relationship conference because we figured, well, 30-something and below, they're going to come. So we thought we'd have like 25 to 50 people in our building, and it was completely packed out, like wall-to-wall, young adults. And um, I thought to myself as I walked in, I go, they're going to keep those masks on for a while, but they're coming off. Because it's a singles conference. They want to see what each other look like. And, um, you know, in, in hindsight, some of the guys who came would have been better off if they would have left the mask on. But the damage is done, guys. So anyway. Um, so I went in the, in the green room with the other communicators. And I, I said, you know what's going to happen? We're all going to get sick tonight. And then sure enough, a few days later, uh, a number of us got COVID. And I woke up at 2 a.m. with that sense of heaviness on your chest. Remember that? And I, I had doctors in the past, I've had pneumonia a few times, say, you know, what could probably take you out in the future is, is uh, pneumonia. So uh, for a, a fleeting moment or two, I thought, this could be the end for me. Like, this could be the thing that takes me out. And then in my vanity, I thought, what a lousy way to die, die of the flu. And I, I had friends that, you know, I, I, a couple of friends had passed away and they were on respirators and stuff. I thought, man, what a lousy way to go. I, I always sort of picture myself dying in some kind of exotic, you know, courageous fashion like smuggling Bibles into North Korea, right? Come on. Or, or saving my, my wife from some kind of attacker or, uh, or getting in a slap fight with Will Smith, you know. <laughs> Just something different, something interesting, I- I- exotic, but, but not the flu. But for a few days, faced with my mortality, uh, I, I lived a little differently. I, I was more intentional. I thought more about, like, what am I actually living my life for? And am I living for the things that matter, matter the most? And so it was like a little midterm exam for me. And uh, my experience with people who think the most about death is they tend to live with the most intentionality and with the most passion. So I know it's Easter, and we're going to get to Easter hope and pastels and candy and all that stuff here in a little bit. But I want to encourage you to think about your death for a few moments. So happy Easter. You're going to die. Okay? <laughs> You're going to die. Okay? Uh, which brings us to Eben Alexander, uh, who was a neurosurgeon at Harvard's Children's Medical School, and a very devout atheist, uh, who once said, if you don't have a working brain, you can't be conscious. This is because the brain is the machine that produces consciousness in the first place. When the machine breaks down, consciousness stops. Pull the plug, and the TV goes dead. The show is over, no matter how much you might have been enjoying it. Well, in uh, November of 2008, uh, his worldview was changed. He he caught a a rare brain infection, and uh, it crashed his whole neocortex, and for a whole week, he was in a coma. And during that time, he had zero brain activity. No beta waves, just flatlined. And he said on the other side of his biological consciousness that he remained conscious, and he encountered a brilliant, vibrant, ecstatic, stunning, lots of superlatives here, new world, a place fueled by an exhilarating sense of unconditional love. And on the other side, he he encountered the face of this woman looking at him with like curiosity and delight. And he wasn't sure who she was. But then he became conscious after a week. And uh, pondering his experience, he began to make some life changes, one of which was to reconcile with people that he felt some anger towards. And so he was adopted as a young child and uh, tracked down his birth family and got to know them. And then about two weeks after he met them, they sent this letter in the mail, and inside was a picture. And when he pulled the picture out, it was a picture of his sister who'd passed away earlier that he had never met. It was the face of the woman that he saw on the other side. Kind of a cool story. Well, as you can imagine, um, his life was forever altered. And he said that my experience showed me that the death of the body and the brain are not the end of consciousness, that human experience continues beyond the grave. More importantly, it continues under the gaze of a God who loves and cares about each and every one of us. 
Is that good news? Uh, he went on to write a book called Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. It was the number one New York Times bestselling book for a number of weeks. I've read the book. It's a fascinating book. And what he had was a, a near-death experience, okay? And, and thousands of near-death experiences have been recorded and researched over the last few decades. And, and they tend to have common traits, like 10 to 12 common traits, um, three of which are a God of unconditional love who, who looks upon us and delights in us, uh, a welcome team made up of people that, that either we, we knew, they were family members who had a bond with us, or maybe even family members we, we've never met before, and sometimes members of our spiritual family. And then this life review where people see like an, a panoramic display, the events of their lives. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. Um, these traits are true of people in Eastern cultures as well as Western cultures. So in spite of people's worldviews or religious background, they tend to have the same kind of experiences. So we're going to come back and talk about these three traits in a few moments. Uh, but I want to talk about the limits of NDEs and what they can teach us. First of all, they can teach us that there is consciousness after death. So Evan Alexander's worldview regarding consciousness has been radically altered by his experience. Um, the prevailing worldview in, in universities and academic settings is that, that of materialism, that, that uh, our, our brain, when it gets shut off like a computer, that's it. Consciousness ends. Near-death experiences are strong evidence that consciousness continues even after our biological con consciousness ends. All these people say, I, no, I remain conscious. I was flatlined, heart, mind, but I, I continue to experience things. And so as far as Jesus, we believe in a mind, we believe in a soul, and uh, these experiences are strong evidence that our belief is validated, not only by the Bible, but by people's experiences. Um, what they can't teach us is what actually happens when we die. The way I think about it is like they're, they're looking through a, a, like a keyhole and these people can see on the other side and they know what the colors are and they can see some of the furniture, but they don't actually go through the keyhole and experience death. That's why they call them near-death experiences, not death experiences. And so what we need is we need somebody who's gone through the keyhole, gone to the other side, maybe someone who's actually built what's on the other side. Anybody want to take a guess as to who that might be? Okay, we're, we're here to celebrate him today. Yeah, we, we need Jesus. And that's why it's important for us to talk about the difference between resuscitation and resurrection. So people who have near-death experiences, they're resuscitated. They, they, they die in a biological body, they remain unconscious, but then they come back in that biological body. Jesus was actually raised from the dead. His body was similar but it was different. It was a renewed body. And this is the hope of Easter. The ultimate hope of Easter is not just that we go to heaven when we die, but in the future that we're, we're resurrected when God restores the world and, and heaven and earth come to together. And our bodies will be like renewed versions of the bodies we have now. But they'll be better. And they'll be able to experience other dimensions of reality. And they'll be healthy and immortal and spiritual and glorious. And so we, we see in Jesus' post-resurrection experiences, and if you're new to Scripture, he, he appeared to over 500 people, it says, in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's a fact that was validated because these people were still living when 1 Corinthians 15 was written. They go, yeah, I, I saw him, I saw him. In fact, I'll give you addresses of other people who saw him. But his body was different. Um, the, the order of magnitude of the kind of miracles that he could do was much greater. So, for example, people could touch him, and they could see his scars, and they could eat meals with him and joke with him and laugh with him. But he could be in Jerusalem one moment, and then in another moment, he could be 75 miles away in Galilee. He, he could walk through walls. And then ultimately, he, he ascended in glory to be with his heavenly Father. So we just get a glimpse from these appearances as to what our resurrection body uh, may look like. On, on the week leading up to the, the passion of Jesus, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, he was going to Bethany because he had some friends there, Mary and, and Martha and Lazarus. And uh, scholars say that was like ground zero for Jesus during his Passion Week. He wanted to probably get away from the disciples and just be with some friends and have some warm, you know, cooked meals. And on, on his way to Bethany, he discovered that Lazarus had died. And then, in fact, he'd been dead for, for four days. And so when he arrived in Bethany, he raised Lazarus from the dead but it was not a resurrection body, it was a resuscitated body. He came back in the same body that, that he, he uh, lived in, and then he later died. But in the context of that res resuscitation story, uh, Jesus said about himself in John eleven twenty five 25 through 26, I am the resurrection and the life. 
the one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That is the question Easter begs us to ask. Do we believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life? Can I get an amen from maybe a few people? Okay, okay, good. Just checking to see who's here today. All right, so before we go home and we eat a bunch of chocolate and and food and get like a self-induced coma and have our own near-death experiences perhaps, um, let's talk about these three traits that are common among people who have near-death experiences and then what Jesus has to say through his revelation about each of these traits. So first of all, most people who have an experience, they they encounter like an unconditional love, a a God of unconditional love, personal love. Uh, Ian McCormick who uh, was a child of the 70s. Some of you had hair like that back in the 70s, the BG kind of haircut. Uh, he, he grew up in, in New Zealand, and he didn't just take a, a gap year. He took two years to go party. He traveled in Australia and Africa and, and Indonesia, uh, searching for the perfect wave. He was a big surfer, uh, the perfect girl, the perfect high. And, and one evening, he was, he was scuba diving with friends off the, the coast of Mauritius, and a, a school of box jellyfish stung him. Now, apparently, one sting from a box jellyfish can kill you. He was stung four times. Well, his friends got him to an ambulance so he could go to a hospital. And he heard this voice in the ambulance as he began to evaluate what was happening. And and he had been taught as a young boy that there's this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and it goes something like, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But the voice wasn't the voice of his mother who taught him this prayer. And, And by the way, he'd become a devout atheist over the years. But he heard this voice say, forgive us our debts. And so he began to rapidly ask God to forgive him. He wasn't sure if God was like Shiva or Kali or Jesus or whatever. He didn't know what God looked like, but he was, I, I got to confess some sins here. And then he thought about that, that line, forgive us our debtors. And so he began to forgive some people. And then he lost consciousness. And, and as he lost consciousness, he found himself falling backwards. Sometimes you hear about this tunnel, a, a tunnel that's dark. And by the way, uh, a lot of people have great experiences with their, when they almost die. Uh, other people have not so great experiences. His was in the latter category. So he's falling backwards, he said, and, and he's in this dark, dark tunnel. And he, he wondered to himself, hey, wait a minute, I just asked for forgiveness. How come I'm falling backwards and it's all dark? But then he saw this little speck of light. As he looked at the light, he found himself stopping and being moved and drawn towards the light. And he said in the darkness, he couldn't even see his hand. But as he got closer and closer to the light, not only could he see his hand, it became like translucent. Um, The Bible describes our resurrected bodies as being like full of light, like like shining like the stars in the universe. And they'll have this translucent, like glorious shimmer to them. So as he continued to draw closer and closer to the light, he said it looked like a white fire or a mountain of cut diamonds sparkling with the most indescribable brilliance. As he moved closer and closer to the light, his shame began to melt away. He said the garments were not man-made fabrics, but were like garments of light. He says, as I lifted my eyes up, I could see the chest of a man with, with his arms outstretched as if to welcome me. I looked towards his face. It was so bright, it seemed to be about 10 times brighter than the light I'd already seen. It made the sun look yellow and pale in comparison. It was so bright that I couldn't make out the features of his face, but I knew that I was standing in the presence of Almighty God. There's a growing body of scientific evidence that when we feel the most joyous human beings, it's when we're looking in the face of someone who delights in us, someone who loves us. As human beings, we were made for all kinds of emotions and experiences and highs and lows and ecstasy and all that, but but the, 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 the... sense that we want the most is this deep down soul satisfying joy that permeates our whole souls and that's what people often describe their near death experiences as being like this deep down completely satisfying joy um, i've got only five kids um <laughs> three are old and they're on the east coast i got a two-year-old and a four-year-old and uh, when i come home from work i like to pick them up either at the same time or one at a time and I want them to know how, how happy I am to see them. And so I'll look in their faces, and I want them to see me smiling, and I want them to see the, the delight I have in them. And it's like in those moments, I, I can feel this like transfusion of joy from my heart going into theirs. I'll watch their face begin to, to light up and shine. Some of you parents know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. 
Um, that is what awaits us in heaven. Uh, Psalm 1611 says, you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Um, I'm a bit of a Bible nerd, and so I like to read original languages sometimes. If you're new to Scripture, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And, and the word in Hebrew for presence is face. It's panim. It means face. And so a literal translation of Psalm 1611 would read like this. You fill me with joy as your face lights up when you look upon me. Some of you weren't just... We're listening just then. I know that happens in crowds like this. So I'm going to read that again, okay? I kind of like this. Uh, Psalm 1611, you fill me with joy as your face lights up when you look upon me. That, my friends, is the hope of heaven. So the next few weeks as we do this forever series, we're going to talk about like, the things we'll do in heaven. If, if your view of heaven is that it's this boring place with like, you know, clouds and harps and stuff, fat little angels, uh, we're going to change that. Like we're going to forever alter your understanding of heaven. We're going to talk about the adventures and the work and the creativity and the learning and the people and the relationships. It's going to be fabulous. But I believe the primary experience of heaven that's going to fill us with the most, most joy is looking into the face of our Heavenly Father and seeing that face shine upon us. Is that good news? Yes. Yeah, man. I'm looking forward to that. Um, the Easter story is what makes that experience possible. Uh, another common trait among those who have near-death experiences is, is that of a welcome team, like people that they knew or people they didn't know but had some kind of connection to them, welcoming them on into heaven, which is why I want to tell you the story of Colton Burpo. Uh, he's a lot older than that, but Colton Burpo, when he was uh, four years old, he, uh, he, he had a near-death experience, uh, <clears throat> and then he came back after a few days and, and lived to tell about it. And, and months later, after he had this experience, he and his father, Todd Burpa, were driving across Nebraska, and he said to his father, hey, Dad, we have, I have like a, a great-grandfather named Pop, don't I? And Todd said, uh, how'd you hear about him? Oh, I met him. In fact, I stayed with him in heaven. He's really nice, Dad. So you can imagine that rattled Todd, so he pulled his car over for a little bit and asked him more questions, and then they, they rushed home, and then Todd Burpa went into the closet, got this box of pictures and stuff, and he held up a picture of Pops, his grandfather. And he was about 79 in the picture, and he had glasses on. And, and Colton looked at the picture and kind of squinted. And he goes, no, that's not him. He said, Dad, people aren't old in heaven. And, and they don't wear glasses. Okay. So this is really good news for about 22% about of us this morning. It was good news for 80% of the people who were at the uh, 730 service. So, But... <laughs> As expected. <clears throat> but isn't that great news? Like we're not going to be old in heaven and glasses going away. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have new knees and I'm going to have hair. Like I'm, I'm like super excited about it and I have no idea like what the hairstyles will be in heaven, but I'm growing hair past my butt <laughs> just to make up for some lost time. So then his dad, you know, showed him this picture when he was younger, like 29. He goes, oh yeah, that's what he looks like. That's, that's Pops. Well, uh, a few years later, Colton was in the kitchen baking cookies with his mom, and he just sort of randomly said, hey, mom, I have two sisters, don't I? And uh, his mom said, no, you, you just, it's just Cassie in the other room. And he said, no, I, I have two sisters. He said, mommy, you had a baby die in your tummy, didn't you? Well, time stopped again in the Burpo house. And he went on to say, uh, she doesn't have a name. You guys didn't name her. And his mom said, you're right, Colton. W we did not even know she was a she. Colton responded by saying, that's okay. She said she can't wait to meet you when you and daddy get to heaven also. Someone here needed to hear that today. I I've lost three kids before they were born. And this gives me great hope. And I hope for some of you, it gives you hope as well. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 8, it says, Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, and he was gathered to his people. A few chapters later, it says the same thing about Isaac. He died and was gathered to his people. Um, there are other passages and verses that indicate that we'll be gathered to our people. 
we'll be gathered to those who had the deepest bonds with us, those who loved us and, and those who loved God. Uh, my father passed away seven years ago last week. My sisters have a way of reminding me of this. And I'm grateful for that. And uh, some of you know my story, many of you don't, but uh, didn't have a very close relationship with my father growing up and, and, and also in most of my adult years. But he came to faith uh, 10 years before he passed away. And then he became my best friend. I saw this very radical transformation happen in his life. And Sunday afternoons were the best. I always call him. I used to clean my daughter's ballet studio, and I'd call him on the way to Highlands Ranch and just catch up. We'd talk about what, you know, he and his mom or his wife, my mom, uh, ate that week. And uh, I, I'd tell him about what happened. And he would always gripe about the stock market, you know, because that was one of his quirks. No matter how good it was doing, he would gripe about it. And, and then I would just share with him whatever, like, personal or leadership conundrum that I was facing. My dad was one of the greatest leaders I've ever met. And he never gave me advice. But I just sensed he knew what I was going through. And that meant so much to me. And I really miss his face. I really do. But I have this hope that one day he'll be on my welcome team. Along with others. And by the way, if some of you go before me, you're members of my spiritual family. Like you're family to me. And you better be on my welcome team. <laughs> Especially if you're in my simple church. I'm expecting a bottle of wine, a meal. We're going to have a lot of catching up to do. Okay. Well, who do you hope is going to be on your welcome team? Who do you miss? Who have you been most deeply bonded to in this life? The hope of heaven is that they'll be there with you, waiting for you on the other side. That's the hope that the Easter story gives us today. Um, the final trait that we see in these NDE experiences that uh, Jesus can add some, some color to and some understanding of is that of a, a life review. A life review. I, I've got this friend named John Burke, and we've lost touch over the years, but he, he pastors a church down in Austin, Texas, big mega church, really healthy. And he wrote a book called Imagine Heaven. also was a, a New York Times bestselling book for a while. And he says these, these uh, life reviews that people have that have these experiences, um, again, they're very similar in many ways. Uh, usually what happens is they're in the presence of a being of light that often begins the life review with questions like, how well did you love people? People talk about seeing all these people, and, and they're seeing their life through the eyes of those people. And so no one ever gets you know, asked about the resume or how much money they made or how many trophies they got. It's always about their relationships, the quality of the relationships, not just with people they knew, but even strangers. And the other question that gets asked is, how well did you love God? How well did you love him? People say there's no judgment. That when they're having this life review, there's no sense of judgment or condemnation or shame. Just pure unconditional love. Instead, the people judge themselves. In, in Romans chapter 2, it says, when we stand before God at our judgment, it'll be our thoughts accusing and defending us. And so the way I think about this is it's like that midterm exam I mentioned earlier. Some people get to actually experience a midterm exam where they get their life review. And they can evaluate and make some changes when they come back. But we can have our midterm right now. Maybe just right now in this moment, think about how do you think it will go for you when you stand before this, this God of unconditional love and you're reviewing your life and you're seeing the relationships you had. You're, you're evaluated based on how well did you love? How well did you love people and God? Yeah. Well, Jesus talks about the final exam. Uh, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, he says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Is that a scary passage? Anybody wanting some Easter hope right now? <laughs> All right, me too, me too. I mean, this has been a sobering experience for me to think about these, these near-death experiences and final exam, and, and I, I, I trust it is for you. And this is why we need Easter so desperately. We need Easter hope, okay? So a little more darkness, then we'll get to the hope. All right, uh, I want to explain the Easter story in three circles. Okay, so this circle represents the brokenness of the world, and the band-aids represent like the ways we try to 
fix our brokenness. Okay, so let's go from monologue to dialogue. What are some ways our world is broken? What are some ways that people are broken? A little shout out time. What? War. war. There's a little war going on right now. Hair yeah. Loss. Hair loss. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Hunger. Selfishness. Selfishness. Fear. Fear. Sickness. Sickness. Anger. Anger. Greed. Greed. Okay. We could go on and on, right? What are some ways we, we try to put band-aids on the brokenness in us and in the world? Some ways we try to solve our problems. Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> Numb out, baby. Come on. Money. What? Money. Money. Weed. 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 True Denverite. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Self-discovery, self-help. You know, some of these are good things, right? Um, in- achievement. How about like legislation, politics, increasing military spending, et cetera? Okay. It's funny how no one mentioned dating when I've talked about brokenness. thought I'd hear that from some of the broke people. Okay. So <clears throat> anyway, okay, so our world is broken, but this was not God's original intent. God is a designer God. He designed our world to be full of love. He, he designed us to walk in that love and be filled with this love and be in communion with him and fellowship with him throughout our days. And that in the overflow of our relationship with God, we would love one another perfectly at all times. We'd love the earth. We'd take care of the earth. But the reason that we don't experience the world the way God designed it to be experienced and we experience brokenness instead is because of sin. Now, for some of you coming to church for the first time or you got drugged here by somebody, that may seem like a really judgmental word. But it just means the breaking of moral law. That's all sin is, the breaking of moral law. Because we're made in the image of a moral God, we have a sense of morality inside of us. And so you may not agree with the Ten Commandments or the commandments of Jesus. You and I might differ on what we think is right and wrong, but all of us have this sense of justice and injustice, righteousness and unrighteousness. We have a moral code. Have any of you ever kept your own moral code perfectly and never done anything you know you shouldn't have done? I was going to get an autograph today if you raise your hand. So, okay, all right, that, that's pretty typical. Yet we all break our own moral code. And when we do that, the Bible calls it sin. And that's what leads to brokenness inside of us and brokenness outside of us. There is no such thing as a private sin. All private sin always has public manifestations and ramifications. So that's bad news. Let's get to some good news. Um, This brings us to the Easter story. So Jesus, Christmas first. This is Christmas here. This arrow is Christmas. Um, Jesus came into the world. We celebrate that uh, during our Christmas services He came into the world to show us what God looks like when God puts on flesh. In Jesus, we can see the very face of God. And we see this beautiful human being who is God in the flesh, living a perfect life, healing people, loving people, and teaching people some of the most important teachings human beings have ever, ever heard. And then we go to Good Friday, which is the cross, and he dies on Good Friday. Why did he have to die? Because sin brings death. Sin brings death. And so Jesus went to the cross and he died in our place to take this this sting out of death, to give us the hope that the end of our lives is not the end, that we have heaven awaiting us and resurrection in the future. And so Jesus has taught us um, that if we'll turn from our brokenness and our sin and receive his grace poured out for us on the cross, because we can't earn our salvation, we can only receive it, that in the future we will rise with him to be with him forever. And between now and then, he he wants to bring us along this restoration journey, where as we follow him as disciples, which is just a fancy way of saying students, people who practice the ways of Jesus, he will restore us and prepare us for heaven in the future and resurrection in the beyond. Is that good news? Come on, that's Easter. Let's put our hands together for that good news. So if we make the Easter story our story, and we turn and we receive Jesus as our Savior and our King. It's, it's a package deal. Savior and King. We follow him. We surrender to him. Then our final exam will not be one of condemnation, but of celebration of the goodness of God and the grace of God in our lives. Okay. So this Easter story requires some response. So I want to encourage you to uh, take out your connection cards right now. Hold these babies up. I'm like a parent right now. I'm holding for compliance. Okay. Hold them up, 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 hold them up. No one gets a pass on this. Now, Jason told you that if you fill this out and you have to fill it out, we'll give $10 to uh, Ukraine refugees. We're, we are bribing you. We know that. You can also go to our website and you can give more money to 
Ukrainian refugees. Um, last night, people gamed this. They just threw the cards in thinking we were going to give 10 bucks because they gave us an empty card. We're not gaming this thing. You, gotta, you actually have to fill this out for this to be able to uh, become a charitable uh, contribution. So I'm going to encourage you to be filling it out right now. We've got pens in the back of the seats. Fill those babies out. Please, please, please. And, and again, we're asking you to do this because many of you, we don't have updated information. You've changed email, snail mail, all that stuff. We want to be able to keep up with you and, and share with you throughout the year uh, different ways you can grow with us and be in community with us. So please fill these out. And so uh, one possible response would be that you, you just ask for prayer. You, you may be in a place where you're like, I don't know what I think of this story. I, I have questions. You can write down your questions. We'll respond to those questions. Or maybe you just need prayer. Like, I, I need faith. Like, I don't know if I can believe this. I'm struggling with this. However we can pray for you, let us know how we can pray for you. We are a church that prays. There's people right now in a room praying for you. So that's no way we can pray for you. That's one possible response. Um, another response would be to get baptized. Let me explain that. So if today you make a conscious decision, you're like, the lights just went off for me. Something just happened. I get the story. I've never got it before. Or, or you used to get the story, but you wandered away. You, you stopped letting Jesus be king, and you became king again, and you want to come back. If you're in your heart today wanting to turn and experience God's restoration in your life and, and the, the reconciliation you need with God, to have a future of hope with him, then we would encourage you to get baptized. A lot of churches have you raise hands or, you know, walk down an aisle. That's all great stuff. But Jesus, when, when he would invite people to follow him and receive the hope of eternal life and resurrection, he would say, get baptized. It, it's an initiation ritual. So essentially, when you get baptized, you're saying to Jesus and your friends, hey, I, my sins have been washed away. Not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus has done. My, my old life is dead now, and I've been raised to a new life. And the power of the resurrection, the spirit of Jesus resides in me. And we would love to celebrate that with you. And so we'll baptize you anytime, any place you, you want, lake, streams, whatever, we'll baptize you. Um, we are going to have baptisms here in the building in May. And so um, if today you're turning and, and you want to, uh, like, show Jesus and the watching world and take your first step of obedience, which is baptism, we'd encourage you to check that box today. And then last but not least, uh, we are a church of simple churches, as Jason mentioned earlier. Uh, people ask me all the time, what's the difference between a simple church and a small group? Small groups are great at care and content and connection. We, we value small groups. Uh, simple churches are about those three things, but they're also about accountability. Like, we need the fertile soil of loving relationships to grow optimally. If you isolate yourself and you try to like privatistically follow Jesus by yourself, you're not going to go very far. You're not going to be the kind of fruit, the fruit of the Spirit that you like to see. And so we need people to hold us accountable to apply the Word of God. Not just hear it, but apply it to our lives. And so we do that in our simple churches. And so they're about application and multiplication. So we've got several now that are like generation four. We stay in one and then we help our friends start them. And it's just exploding on us. What you're seeing in the building today is very small in comparison to what's happening in our movement. We have over 2,000 people right now in this movement. And we'd like for you to join the movement with us. And so uh, if you want information about joining a simple church, or better yet, you want to start one, we'd love to train you to gather your friends, people that you want to walk with and journey with spiritually. We'd love to train you and uh, help you grow as a disciple and uh, uh, create your own simple church. So uh, if you're interested in that, you want to be in community, check that box. Check that box. I'm watching to see if you guys have your pins out. Okay, I'm watching, I'm watching, okay. Check that box. So as you're filling those out, the ushers are going to come forward here in just a moment, and uh, we'll pass some baskets, and we'll, we'll collect uh, those connection cards. Uh, let me end by saying uh, this message has been a lot of fun for me to put together. I've been fascinated by these, these near-death experience stories, and, and they have funded my imagination, and they've actually created a deeper longing in me, anticipation for what's on the other side. But these near-death experiences, they're just... There's a peek through the keyhole. That they can't tell us what will happen on the other side. But fortunately, Jesus Christ went through the keyhole, through this empty tomb. And not only has he gone on the other side to tell us what's, what's over there, he's actually built the house we're going to enjoy with him forever. Okay? Amen. And so on the other side, uh, we can look forward to the, the face of God shining upon us with joy and delight as he looks in our face. Because of the Easter story, we have the hope there'll be a welcome team. People who loved us and loved God waiting for us introduced, to introduce us to heaven. And because of the Easter story and what Jesus did for us through his cross and his resurrection, we, we don't dread our final exam. You know, we look forward to it. 
is it's not going to be an examination that leads to condemnation, but celebration of all the goodness of God in our lives. And that, my friends, is the Easter story. Let's pray. Jesus, what can we say but thank you? We, we thank you so much for living for us, for dying for us, for rising for us. You, you went through the keyhole and you promised to take us to the keyhole as well so we can be with you forever and ever. And we look forward to seeing the face of God shining upon us with joy and delight. We look forward to being with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, if the ushers would come forward, we'll pass the baskets. Uh, let's stand together right now and let's seek the Father's face.